The views expressed on this broadcast of the Take 12 Recovery Radio Show do not necessarily reflect those of Take 12 Radio, KHLT Recovery Broadcasting, or our affiliates. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. Now here are your co-hosts, Tony Mesbarger and the Monty Man. Well, welcome, recovery family. How the heck are you? Welcome above the good ship recovery here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial, broadcasting to you from the studios of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting on the outskirts of beautiful Albany, Oregon. And uh, welcome to a brand new show slash workshop called Understanding Intervention uh, with our friend Tony Mesberger from Benchmark Recovery Center. Tony, how how you doing there, brother? I'm good, Monty. Monty, how are you doing, my friend? I, I'm I'm doing well. It's good to hear your voice. Uh, I, I um, I'm excited about this uh, this this workshop because it is so important for people to understand. Uh, what intervention is, what it isn't, how it can help. Uh, there's right ways, there's wrong ways, and there are um, different ways. True? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. This is a uh, listeners. This is a four-part uh, series workshop that we are uh, that we are producing, and this is part one called "Intervention: What Is It?" And uh, I I have. Uh, uh, Tony was recommended to me by our chairman of our board, uh, Chris Schroeder. And I, I got to tell you, uh, I spent uh, uh, probably a, a good 45 minutes to an hour talk- talking with Tony here a couple of weeks ago. And what a blessing to have this man uh, do this for us here at Take 12 Radio. He's going to be uh, talking to us uh, in four parts. Uh, this one is Intervention, What Is It? Uh, the second will be getting the family on board. The third will be face to face and the fourth will be transport and treatment. Intervention can sound pretty scary, uh, for, uh, not just the person that's being intervened on, but for the family as well, because it, it's, it's an unknown territory, uh, for so many. So we, we are so fortunate to have Tony with us. Tony, before we get into that, uh, tell the listeners a little bit about uh, about Tony Mesbarger and what you do at uh, Benchmark. All right, great. Well, Marty, I, I've been in the industry now a little over a decade. I was invited into this industry by my uh, by my sponsor, uh, a guy named Mark Houston. Uh, I had worked with him over at uh, over at a long longer term place in uh, down here in Central Texas in. Uh, and then, uh, of course, when Mark decided that he was going to go uh, go open up his own place, I followed him out the door. And uh, so I've done admissions. That's all I've ever really done in this industry is admissions. Uh, I've actually opened up a couple of treatment centers. After uh, Mark and I left uh, and did this, I, I left for a couple of years and opened up another treatment center uh, down in South Texas. And, of course, uh, came back here, uh, I guess, probably about two and a half years ago now. I came back here. Marcia Stone invited me back. And, you know, this is home. Central Texas is home. So I've been back here for a couple of years. I've probably worked with Monty probably over 5,000 families at this point. Wow. And, uh, yeah, at least. And uh, to, to my recollection, probably mm, 200 or 2,500 ad- admissions, somewhere around that range. And, of course, I've been involved uh, face-to-face interventions, executing interventions uh, either as a participant or uh, executing them in myself probably at least uh, over 100 times easy. So, you know, and of course, the work that I do on the phones with these families, uh, it's intervention work. I mean, you're you're positioning these families to get their loved one moving towards wellness. So, uh, and I love what I do. Uh, I'm passionate about what I do. I've been blessed, and and, uh, uh, as we all are. And uh, so that's pretty much a little bit of history on me as far as this industry goes in in a nutshell. Uh, okay, so you, you are the director of admissions at Benchmark, true? Correct. Yes. When, when, you know, when some people think of ad, ad, admissions, they think of some, some you know, beautiful blind gal behind a desk and with a, with a keyboard uh, punching in information on, on, your, uh, on somebody's, uh, you know, contract or form and then 
sending them on their way to to the the next step in uh, in entering into a facility. It's a lot more than that, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. And you know what? It, it, it's so funny because not even. Uh, I guess it was probably 30, 45 minutes ago. Of course, Matt Brown was down here in Austin. Right. And uh, we just, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, kind of friends in the admissions world for a long time, and we were laughing about it. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's so far from that. It, it really is. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of time, uh, you know, a lot of time involved in an admission to do it right. Uh, there's a lot of time involved with it. I mean, you you got to get a, a picture of the family dynamics. You you, you know you have to, to to have real good learn uh, listening skills so you can mm-hmm. listen and find out what's really going on, and then you know basically formulate a plan uh, to start start moving their loved one towards wellness. So there's a lot more to it now. You know what you're talking about or what you just described, Monty. It, it is pretty common in treatment centers. Is you know a lot of places take insurance, and and so you'll have people that will get on the phone, and of course they'll take that information, and get it verified, and get back with the uh, potential client, whereas in a private pay model like Benchmark Recovery Center, and that's really the only model I know, um, well, I, I work in some insurance stuff, but, you know, in this private pay model, it's a little tougher. <laughs> you, uh, you know, it's not, it's not real easy to go out and, 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 talk, and talk to somebody who's a complete stranger and get them into a, into a facility. It's, there's nothing easy about that. So one phone call can actually equate to anywhere from 15 to 20 phone calls by the time before you ever <laughs> met the person. And you may have five admissions going on at once. Wow. So a lot of multitasking, a lot of, uh, a lot of that. Well, bless your heart, man, and Godspeed with what you do. Uh, uh, it, it means so much to so many. Uh, all right. Uh, Understanding Intervention is the name of this show slash workshop. Uh, and, and we call it a workshop because uh, we, we, have, uh, we have three workshops right now uh, that are up at Takes Well Radio. Um, on the left-hand side of the page, we have Walking Through the Big Book with Chris Schroeder. We have Walking Through the 12 by 12 with Chris Schroeder. And we have uh, Applying the 12 Traditions in Your Personal and Family Life with Carol Ann Preston. And uh, these are workshops because we, we keep these up all the time. And people can go to them and, and they actually, uh, they're in order, the, the different workshops, and they're, they're meant to be done in order. Uh, and so it's a little different than a regular show. And, and so uh, I just want the listeners to understand this will always be up. You can go back and uh, you, you don't have to dig up archives or anything. It's right there on uh, the Understanding Intervention uh, link. Uh, okay. When people think of intervention, what are some of the uh, mindsets that you run into that may or may not be true? Well, the first thing that's going to happen, of course, the families are are completely, you know, they're completely in fear uh, of the unknown. And it's real common when you do get a call that's going to require some type of an intervention, a family, a formal family intervention, uh, you're going to have a lot of doubt about, yeah. uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the individual or the professional getting their loved one to move towards wellness. Uh, it's real tough. So you're going to get, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of that. Uh, but most of the time it's real fearful and, and, uh, you know, the, the, most of the time the addict or the, and, or the alcoholic has been running the show for quite some time, <laughs> basically holding them hostage and whatnot. And there's a lot of anger involved coming from the addict alcoholic towards the, uh, towards the loved ones and so you know there's there's a lot of factors at play there that keep them from actually and you'll talk to people that have waited years to do it uh, because of those and there's also there's a there's one thing that's really that I've noticed over the years there's a denial system that falls into the family too because you know we as addicts and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a recovered addict myself addict alcoholic and you know we're real good at at, uh, at convincing our families that we're okay. Maybe it's after a detox day, or maybe it's after a couple of a couple of days where you know we're we're smiling and our teeth are shining and we look good. Uh, and then of course the family buys into that. You know that oh well you know I'm making a big deal out of this. Mm-hmm. And so you'll you'll get that quite a bit. And uh, then there'll, there'll be a big denial around these substances that are being used. You'll find that quite often where, you know, they're not real sure, but the more you investigate, you start to see there's narcotics rather than marijuana, say. So right. stuff like that. Right, right. Uh, you know, the uh, the general public has um, been invited uh, into the, the halls of intervention uh, on a couple of television shows. Uh, mm-hmm. First one that comes to mind is uh, uh, Ken Seeley and Intervention on A&E. 
uh, and we've had Ken on the show. What a, what a great guy. Um, does, does that kind of give a person an idea? I mean, we know what tele, how television is. I mean, is that oh, kind of yeah. true to form or, or, or not? Well, you know, look, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, TV's going to be about ratings. We know that. Sure. Uh, you know, listen, to do this business, you know, Ken and Company, Candy, all those folks, right. I mean, your heart has to be in it. I mean, you, you can't bet. just, you know, you can't just go out there and do this without your heart being in it. I mean, you'll never, you'll never have any success. Uh, but, you know, it is at the end of the day about ratings. Now, what a person sees on TV as opposed to the work that's done pre-TV, uh, there's a lot of work that's done before that. What you see on intervention is, is some of the highlights, but, you know, sitting down with the family, you know, educating the family around the disease of addiction, uh, you know, setting up the pre-intervention, the pecking order, the letters, the things along those lines, and then, of course, the, the actual, what, what most people are seeing is, is a, lot of, a lot of different things leading up to that, but uh, there's, there's a lot of work involved in it to do it the right way. Uh, and typically, I mean, you're not going to have a camera crew following you around, and so this person's going right. to be completely, the element of surprise is in place. And uh, that's a very important component to this. Uh, it's one of the things I make real clear with the families that, you know, we want to make sure that there's no, uh, you know, there's nobody talking in the background, there's no, there's nobody out here that's going to, you know, spill the beans, if you will. Sure, So. Sure. But, uh, you know, listen, i got to tell you, Monty, you know, uh, bless the TV shows and, and brought a huge awareness, much like you're doing, and thank you for what you're doing. You bet. Uh, you know, they brought a huge awareness to the disease of addiction. And so if it wasn't for these shows, uh, I really think that a lot of this stuff would just get scraped under the carpet. I can't tell you how many calls I've taken with people that the addicts themselves, the addicts and alcoholics themselves that have been watching these TV shows and almost wishing it was them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll yeah. bet. It's kind of like watching uh, Biggest Loser, and you know you need to lo lose quite a bit of weight. You're going, well, it's fine for them if they got a personal trainer for a month. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, can, you kind of get a little jealous. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I think we all know that one. Yeah, we we sure do. We sure do. Uh, okay, so 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 people are listening today, uh, and uh, some of them may have stumbled across this show by accident. Uh, some in, intentionally. We're talking about intervention. What is it? We're gonna take uh, we're gonna take a short break, and when we come back, more with uh, Tony uh, Messbarger uh, from Benchmark Recovery Center, director of admissions at Benchmark, formerly a Mark U the Mark Houston Center. And uh, in, in fact, when we come back, just touch on that for a second, would you? About Mark Houston and and why it it, it is now Benchmark. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, we'll be back in just a sec. Whether you have completed alcohol treatment or drug rehab multiple times or have never been to any type of structured treatment program, the Benchmark Recovery Center offers a full continuum of care for addiction recovery. This is the Monty Man from Take 12 Recovery Radio. And may I recommend to you Benchmark Recovery Center. They offer an extended care recovery program for adult men and women struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction. Located east of Austin, Texas on 70 acres, the gender-specific 90-day residential program focuses on the 12 steps, life skills, spirituality, and fitness. After completing the residential phase, residents transition into company-owned sober living and 12 months of aftercare monitoring. If you're ready to learn how to live a sober, responsible, committed life full of promise, Benchmark is here for you. To speak with an admission specialist, call 866-905-4550 or visit the website at benchmarkcenter.com. Discover a life full of permanent sobriety with Benchmark Recovery Center. Chris Schroeder, you are listening to Take12Radio.com, recovery talk and positive music. All right, welcome back. And uh, today is the uh, the day we are launching forth on this brand new show slash workshop with Tony Nesbarger, uh, Director of Admissions for Benchmark uh, Recovery Center uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, Benchmark was formerly known as the Mark Houston Center. Can you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, 
Definitely, Mark. Mark was a guy that uh, not only was he was he uh, was he sober and recovered, but Mark was also a gentleman that had worked in the treatment industry for over twenty years. He'd worked in a in, a, in the thirty day model. Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, we both worked together in the longer term model, which was ten months was the minimum, and most of the people stayed there for fourteen months. And both of those places were co ed. Uh, we saw a problem with that, and uh, you know, of course, uh, you know the. the Emerged into the twelve-step process was was part of what they did, but they they would get them into the early steps of a twelve-step process, and it was up to them to go out and find uh, you know find sponsorship and go through the remaining steps. So Mark uh, decided to come and do his own thing, and in two thousand six, June of two thousand six, actually it, st- it started happening in February of uh, of oh six. Mark uh, Mark left Burning Tree and. Uh, he asked me to come with him, and uh, we drove around uh, the Central Texas area. We really we knew we wanted to be in the Central Texas area because of the influences, and so we went out and looked for property, found this uh, this real nice seventy five acre ranch, and uh, developed a program here, gender specific programs, uh, you know, a high level of uh, structure and accountability. Uh, with uh, the you know with with the working out with the, under the supervision of a personal trainer and of course uh, then a nutritional program that complements the working out. Uh, it's just a, in a high exposure to the recovery you know the recovering community out here, uh, and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to park it here in Austin, Texas, because you know we had a strong AA community here that had a lot of influences. You know you had Chris Weimer, you had you know Mark Houston, Chris Schroeder, um, Peter Marinelli. I mean some of the some of the some of the really uh, quality quality guys out there that are uh, that are out there on the circuit uh, were great influences here so we wanted a real strong AA community because this is a two 12 step based recovery center and Mark didn't want to do treatment anymore he decided that he was going to come out here and open this place up take people through the 12 step process uh, get them through it in that total while they have it, while they're here they have that spiritual experience a necessary uh, vital uh, uh, spiritual experience and of course uh, get them uh, get them through the processing and uh, then move them into a continuous Continuum of care. Once they've completed this process, by uh, branding our own our own uh, I call it transitional living, uh, where they go over there and they're there under our care with a high level of, of uh, structure and accountability. We do not commingle with other treatment centers. That was part of Mark's deal: is one voice, one message. And of course, we have a 12-month uh, continuum of care uh, product called the Segway program, which is a 12-month monitoring program, which is. Something that uh, that a lot of places are starting to do. It's a it's an it's an in-house it's an in-house uh, monitoring program where, you know, while we have them here on property, uh, we actually get to know them and uh, mm-hmm. we have recovery coaches that do groups and whatnot. And uh, once they leave, of course, we know how they're wound, if you will. Sure. And, uh, we're in contact with the families and whatnot. So in a nutshell, that's that's what we did. I mean, Mark's vision was was true twelve step based um, immersion and uh and physical fitness and, and nutrition and uh and, and again the design the, the the chronic relapser person that's been out in the rooms can't catch traction picking up desire chips left and right uh had multiple treatment episodes that was our client yeah and yeah so, is 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 Segway similar to the maps program it is there's there's some similarities there yeah. um you know, there these monitoring programs. I mean, they were designed specifically around. Well, you know, in the, in the very beginning, and you know this that the you know doctors, lawyers, dentists, anybody with a li- is a licensed professional right. has a requirement once they've been they've been identified as a substance abuser, goes to treatment, and then have to be monitored for up to a couple of years. Some in, in some cases longer than that. And as a result of it, you'll see, like for instance, dentists have a real high success rate because of that. Mm. Again, the name of the game is structure and accountability. So what we've done is. We, we designed this, actually, we designed this in the early days of Mark Houston Recovery before we were Benchmark Recovery Center. We uh, we designed this in the very early days where, you know, we talk to the families, we talk to the therapist, we talk to the sponsor, we do random UAs, we do all the things to, that the licensed professional is required to do. And as a result of that, it takes the family completely out of the picture, so they're not playing the monitor, they're not looking over, you know, constantly, you know, hammering their kids if, uh, you know, right. they're meetings or not and whatnot or takes the family completely out of it and of course it's also the recovery coaches are moving their families down a road of wellness as well teaching them what is enabling versus what is healthy support so it really it helps the family and the addict alcoholic uh, to you know to proceed in their recovery good right on uh okay uh intervention uh, what is it some people 
uh, believe with all their heart that they can uh, do the intervention themselves. Mm, uh, not good. You know, they, they, they think, well, you know, we've seen it on TV or we've heard about it or we've read a book and uh, we haven't tried this yet. Let's try to do it ourselves first before we spend all sorts of money or contact our insurance company or whatever. Um, why is that not a good idea? It's a real, it's, a, it's, it's not a good idea at all. Um, you know, part of, part of the problem is, is this. You, you know, part of our big, our big book tells it beautifully in the doctor's opinion. It says frothy emotional pills seldom suffices. <laughs> yeah. And what they're saying in that, in that small sentence there, uh, what the doctor's saying is that, you know what, if, if the family's words, if the family's, in some cases, uh, some of their actions were enough to get the, 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 the person moving towards wellness, it would happen. It would happen, yeah. Uh, a lot of times what you'll do, because of the nature of the family of origin, they'll come in and they'll try to execute one of these on their own. Well, guess what happens when it's unsuccessful? They're point, there's, point, there's finger pointing. Yeah. Uh, well, you shouldn't have said that, or you should have said that, or you shouldn't have said that, and whatnot. And so you know, what you'll find is you'll, you'll find the family divided at the end of the day. And not only that, but when you do have to hire a, 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 you know, a professional interventionist to come in and do that work, it makes it, you're, you're an uphill battle at that point. Uh, you know, trying to sew some things up and, and whatnot. So it's always important to get to, to get a professional involved if you're thinking about doing this because it just well, it does a couple of things. It neutralizes the room by having a professional in the room. They don't have any emotions tied to it, any feelings, any of this stuff that uh, that uh, the family does. Mm -hmm. So it's real important to get somebody uh, a professional involved. I mean, you know, get a Matt Brown or Sam Davis or you know one of these guys out here that are just doing some real quality work to come. And, and intervene on these on these guys or women and men. Um, in talking with Matt uh, here recently, uh, and we we chuckle about this, but it really isn't funny. Um, he had a, a a young man that he was in the process of transporting, and, and that's actually going to be one of our topics during this workshop is transporting. That's treatment. always fun. Yeah. <laughs> And I guess, I guess in the middle of downtown Portland, the guy, the guy just jumped out of the car and ran away. <laughs> uh, 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 it happens. I, 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 has that ever happened to you or, or to the people you work with? I've I've had somebody actually walk. We did an I did an intervention up in Louisville, Texas, outside of Dallas. And the young man uh, stormed uh, stormed out of the house, and he came back. He was calmed down a little bit, and then he started getting a little bit uh, violent. So I asked the family to let's go ahead and exit. And uh, of course, we walked down the sidewalk, and he turned around and came back outside. Said, "All right, you guys win." And and uh, and we got him that way. But I've never had anybody <laughs> anybody run generally, you know, in, in transport. I mean, that's you know, I, I mean. Transports are tough. I mean, they really are. Yeah. You got you. you literally, I, I sometimes I, I talk about you know having one of those little dog leashes, right? You know that they put you know, or, you know they put on kids. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we'll make them wear a fluorescent jacket or something, you know, so you can watch them popping in and out of places. But uh, it's it's tough, right? I've not had anybody run though. I've 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 been pretty successful at just just making sense of it for them and, and then calmly meeting them where they're at and walking them through the process. Sure, sure. You, you you bet. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting to watch. Uh, sometimes on Dr. Phil, they'll do a, uh, what, you know, what happened after the, the show. And the person that has agreed to, to go to Origins or Benchmark or wherever they're going, it changes their mind, right? And uh, mm -hmm. they're trying to get him in the car and they actually have a transport, for lack of a better term, bouncer. <laughs> yes, uh, sure. You know, this, sure. because in many of these cases, these are minors, and sorry, you're going. You know, uh, uh, it, it, what has been your ex well? You know what? I'm going to save that for the transport piece. Um, I, okay, so when you when when somebody approaches you and says, "I believe we need your help," what is the very first thing you do? Well, the, the most important thing that you can do is, is, is first, you have years and years, money and a lot of cases of people that have, that they want to vent. They just want to unload. They just yeah. want somebody to hear 
what's going on now. On the other end of this line, of course, you know, addiction shows up the same. You know this. Addiction shows up the same in everybody. So you'll hear some similarities. But what you're, what you're, you're drawing from that, that initial conversation is just a lots of history. Generally, what I try to do is I let them talk. And at the same time, I'm taking notes, and I'm guiding them towards family of origin, and I'm trying to draw a comprehensive picture of the family dynamics, what's in play. And, and in there, you know, I'm also trying to find out where the leverage is. Is, what kind of leverage there is on this individual? Because really, you know, you talked about people walking off, you know, walking off or running off. A person's not going going to necessarily leave if they really believe the boundaries that were set in the intervention were solid and that, 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 that there's no outs. The disease loves an out, and if it's got an out, it's going to take it. The only t- only time somebody will run from a treatment from a treatment center or from an intervention or, or or a transport or anything like that. The only time they'll run is when they think they still have options. Right. You take the, you, you, when you take those options off the table, and that's a, there's the work that we talked about earlier that has to be done with the family pre-intervention. Once you take those options off the table, they don't have those options, and they start moving towards wellness. There's not the game is up, tilt, it's over. Sure, sure. And and, and do you see on the faces of these of these folks, um, kind of a, a, a relief, a, a a moment of, ah, uh, it's over. Uh, it, it's got it's got to be there's got to be some freedom there that a person actually feels, regardless of how hard they were fighting, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and you know, again, I was talking to Matt about this earlier. You know, it's amazing. I mean, I've been on interventions and in executed interventions where you're walking down the sidewalk, they look out the window and see everybody coming. You open up the door and they they know what's going on. And uh, you know, you don't need, you you let them read a few letters, or maybe you you just pack them up and go, let's go, and bring the letters with them and right. and give it to the treatment team or the, uh, treatment team. Most what I have seen most of the time, these people are by the time that the uh, that, the, that they've gotten to the point of where the family's going to intervene. I mean, really, things have really come apart at this point in time. They're usually event-driven. Uh, something's happened. Maybe, maybe it's a DUI, DWI, or a possession of a controlled substance charge. It's some kind of a charge. Something's happened. Uh, it's event-driven. And so, you know, most of them are looking for a way out. Uh, that's been that's been that's been mo- most of the time. A lot of times, you know, like if you're dealing with a methamphetamine addict, I mean, that's those are the tough ones, you know, or yeah. a hallucinogen addict, you know, somebody who's taking LSD or mushrooms or something along those lines. Uh, you know, they're in such denial. I mean, they're not even in denial; they're just in another world. They're, the, the drug the drug psychosis is incredible that uh, you really can't see anything until you get them landed in some place and get them a little distance between them to, between the drug and them. But uh, most of the time, yes. That's a long answer to the fact that you'll see you'll see them a lot of times when you get them on a plane, uh, you know they'll open up, uh, you know they'll, they'll completely open up, and uh, you know they're just they're, they're just relieved. Yeah, you bet. Um, what percentage would you say uh, of folks that are being intervened on are cross addicted? Large large percent. Nowadays, you bet. Yeah, I would tell you so. Now, I would, I, I couldn't have said that probably six or seven years ago. Right. That's amazing. Nowadays, I, that's a great question, Monty. I got to tell you, uh, I would probably tell you five years ago I started to see a shift uh, where you started to see this epidemic that's going on in this country. It's not. It's, it's no secret to the, us in the, in this field. I sure. mean, opiates are just completely out of control along with methamphetamine. And, you know, start seeing a shift where you've got, uh, you've got, uh, you know, more opiate addicts between the age of, you know, 18 and 25. Most every call that you're going to get is going to be from that, that population. Uh, and so you're going to see that. And then, of course, there, there's always other drug, drugs involved. I mean, there's usually, you know, most, most of these kids are smoking marijuana or, you know, drinking seems to be pretty prevalent. But, you know, I was talking to the folks the other day. I'd, I'd love to just give a straight line alcoholic every once in a while. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? I'll tell you this. I'm seeing, we're seeing quite a few women, and interesting enough, we're seeing quite a few women, young women, uh, you know, college-age women that are coming in, you know, alcoholic. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. everybody, and, and another thing, too, is that, that, of course, everybody's been dual diagnosed. Uh, yeah. that, that uh, they're coming to treatment now, or if they've had a treatment episode before, they've been diagnosed, which I think is is somewhat, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I have my own opinion on that. Uh, you know, you're bringing somebody in off the streets off of heroin, and you're going to give them a diagnosis a weekend. Uh, I, yeah, I know. But, that, that's right. Let me, let, 
let's get you sober yeah, and then yeah, let's see yeah. what the underlying issues are. We know oh. these drugs and the alcohol are not the problem. That's the solution to their to a much exactly. larger issue. Exactly. And I, and I have to say, I'm laughing because uh, uh, this is a real pet peeve of mine. I mean, you, you get somebody that is, you know, a week off of opiate-based pain medications, alcohol, and, and God knows what, and you sit them in front of a nurse practitioner or somebody, you know, and, and they're diagnosing them manic depressive. Well, of course they're manic and depressed. My gosh. <laughs> They've been that's that treated alcoholism, and I'll tell you what that's I right. often is, you know, I'll get I'll get these I'll get the families, and when the first thing that usually happens with these families, and it's no fault of theirs. I mean, this is just right. There's a sure. lot of you know misinformation that they've been given, but the first thing that they'll say is, well, you know, uh, Johnny or Susie, you know, they're 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 bipolar, manic depressive, or whatever, and mm -hmm. and, and I'll ask them, I'll say, well, what's the longest that that they've been sober, and they'll say, well, I don't know, they had a couple of weeks one time, you know, I'm like really. <laughs> so so we're, how do we really know what's going on? Because untreated alcoholism shows up as a lot you of bet. those things. I mean, you know, if, I, if I'm a, a dry alcoholic out there, I'm going to be, I'm going to suffer from some depression. I'm going to have some fear. Of course. I'm not going to be just real happy. And I'm going to find myself, uh, you know, not getting along with you very well. I'm going to be a rattlesnake. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, all of those things show up as untreated alcoholism, but we're real quick to put a diagnosis to it and throw a pill at it. We are. Whereas, you know, we're, you know, like Benchmark's model is, let's get them sober first. We're med friendly, but we're certainly not med pushers. We're not gonna we're not we're not gonna push meds on somebody. Let's see how they present when they come in, and then get them good and sober, take them to the work, and we'll start to see what's going on with them, and then address it at the appropriate time. Right, right. Uh, let, let me ask you, uh, Tony, uh, what about repeat interventions? I mean, it, it, do you guys uh, ever encounter an intervention that has happened uh, with the same person maybe two, two or three, four, even four times? Well, the most I've ever been involved with was the second time. I've never, you know, I, I just, I can't, I couldn't see myself. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there was a lady that I was working, or a family I was working with. Uh, it couldn't have been more than three or four weeks ago. Uh, this lady had been intervened on, you know, maybe three or four times at least, three or four times. And, you know, I told the family, I said, well, so, so what's going to be new about this? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the, you, you mentioned at the onset of this of this uh, this interview, it's like, you know, there's a couple of approaches to take, and then, you know, that's pretty much all, that, that's all there is. I mean, they're either going to agree or not. But what has to happen in those cases is, is true boundaries have to be set, and that's what I've seen over the course of time is where the family just, there, you know, there's no intervention that's going to work. The only intervening that needs to happen at this point in time is the enabling needs to stop. Right. Because right. there has to be an enabler in order for this stuff to survive. And so, uh, you know, for the disease of addiction to survive. So yeah. basically when it gets to that point in time, you just make some solid recommendations to the family, find out who, you know, who are the enablers, shut it down, and then, of course, you'll start to see them pop up for air. They'll come up for air. And has it ever occurred that, that the intervention uh, shifted gears and... Uh, or, or, or started out uh, being focused on one individual and it ended up bringing in more than just the one individual, maybe another family member? Well, the whole family needs help. I mean, yeah. of that. I mean, that's why we have the we have we have the family programs of Al-Anon and Alateen and whatnot. Uh, you know, so there's some so there's there's obviously suggestions made. There's 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 sometimes when you'll walk into one, and you know this pre intervention before you actually execute the intervention right. itself on yeah. the individual that's been the, 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 the intended patient. You'll see you'll see uh, right off the bat where you know if there's somebody real dug in. Let's say mom is. It just can't get just can't get past the enabling piece of it. Then you might recommend uh, you know some of these programs that are out there, maybe a two a two week program that they go to. Sometimes in the pre intervention, you'll identify you'll know that there's no way that you're going to make any headway unless you get that individual into treatment first. So a lot of times you'll send the mother, the father, or maybe it's uh, you know a grandparent or something like that. You'll go ahead and get them into a situation where they start to move down a path of wellness for themselves, and then they can join the intervention or I, you know when the pecking order when you're when you're trying to find out who's going to be influential and who's going to be in the intervention 
patient itself, you can identify where you're, you, you you might have to ask somebody not to be not to participate, right. and that can really cause a lot of issues as well. That's a whole other that's a whole other show. Right, <laughs> right, right. And, and, and we we could talk about more about that maybe on uh, getting the family on board. The, the second that's a good that would be a perfect time to talk about. Yeah, it. yeah, you bet. Uh, yeah, because I, I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, you know, how many times have I heard somebody say, yeah, but. You don't know how bad she is, you know, she or, or how bad he is. I mean, my gosh, mom, you know what? You've been drinking for years. What are you talking about me for? You know. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, and it complicates things too. If you, yeah. if you have a if you have a substance abuser or an alcoholic in the, you know, uh, let's I'm just using examples here. Let's say you have a father that has a drinking issue and has for years and you bring him into the intervention, of course, you know, pretty much it's, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, you know I mean? Unless you have, unless he's holding the purse strings or the heart strings, you know, in some form or fashion, uh, it's going to be real hard to move that individual because there, there's no respect, if you will. And of course, they're always, you know, the, the alcoholic and or addict plays victim. You know, that, that's, you that's one of the roles that we play is, is, uh, is, is, you know, active addiction is his victim. So, you know, Dad, if you didn't do this, if you didn't drink, look at you, you drink. He said it just a moment ago. I mean, they'll throw out all those those things. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. showstoppers is what I call them. Uh, when, when you're engaged in an intervention, or I should say uh, uh, the pre-intervention, uh, do you ever get butterflies? I mean, is, is it ever become just comfortable? Oh, you you talking about as as the person executing the intervention? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I I don't know. You know, it's it's that's a great question too. You asked this wonderful questions, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I want to tell you that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking. Are you sure you haven't done these? Uh, uh, I've got to tell you. You know, I guess you know the first couple are always like that, but once you start to do it. Uh, you know, it's really, I, I don't try to bring that energy into any kind of intervention. I walk in, I'm going to get my guy. I'm going to get my girl. Yeah. And they're, they're going. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, you know, and I, and I really pump the family up in that way, too. So it's, it's non negotiable, really. We're going to call you, we're uh, going to call you Tony the Bounty Hunter. We're going to call you Tony the Bounty Hunter. <laughs> go get him. Yeah, you go uh, get him. Marcia says sometimes, Marcia says, well, just jump a plane and go get him. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, and let's let's touch on that just for a second here. Um, uh, what about the interventionist? I, I mean, we we talk quite a bit uh, here at at the station. We talk uh, quite a bit about uh, people that are uh, in this field, uh, professionals and volunteers, laymen alike, uh, get so involved in our work. Um, that the very work we do can take its toll on us and our own recovery. Uh, so, what about the interventionist? I mean, I mean, I mean, this has got to be heartbreaking. Well, it is, and I got to tell you too, it, it, it can be. You know, I think there's there comes a time. I mean, I mean, in my early days in admissions, thank God I had the mentors that I had, Monty. I mean, I had, yeah. I had one of the best in the in the world. You know, in Mark and. You know, I remember coming in and I was just completely heartbroken around a, a lady that, uh, that that I had been working with her to get her son in, and, and this is out of Florida, and he had died during the process of the inter oh, man. intervention itself, but during the intake call. And I remember I took it real hard, and, and you know, Mark pulled me in in a real gentle way and said, "Look, you know, this is part of the business, my friend, because you know, uh, you know, guys, I want you to remember something. Thank God that the successes outweigh the failures, because it, you, there'd be no way you can do this." And I pretty much held on to that sense. You know, and so, uh, but but back to the to, to the interventionist or anybody in this field for that matter. I mean, most of us that, that work in this field. I mean, we we are in recovery. We make the best advocates. Uh, I'm not, sure. I'm not saying, you know, for you know, as a as a whole, right? But right. You know, as far as the addict and alcoholic goes, I mean, you know, our book talks about that as well. When it says, you know, that one addict helping another addict, you know, it's it's or alcoholic. Uh, you know, I can speak the language. And so, you know, a lot of us work in this field, and, and we don't. Uh, you know, and I've been very guilty of that myself. I have, 
I have uh, placed my uh, my work and made it my recovery, and that's very easy yeah. to interchange that. Yeah. And once you've done that, you set yourself up for for a relapse for sure. And I have relapsed in this field before, and uh, and I did that around that very thing. Was was thinking, well, you know what, I'm doing this work, and you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm taking care of these people, and and you, I, 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 I could never fall into that trap again. This is about. This is absolutely about having your own body of work, your own recovery going on separate from the work that you do here. You bet. You have to. I have to. On my personal one said, I Me have too. to. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens here is you're working with families in crisis. You're working with people in crisis all the time. And if you start to, if you start to make this your work, uh, you're setting yourself up. Or I'm setting myself up. So yeah, thank yeah. God. You yeah. know, and I look back on it and I'm thank God I've had that experience because I've been able to transmit that to other people in this field uh, and let them know that, look, be on guard here. And I've been able to spot it in other people and help them move in another direction. So, you know, I turned it into a blessing. Right, right. Th- thank goodness for accountability. I, I, I remember uh, uh, during uh, during treatment years ago uh, when I was going through uh, outpatient, uh, we, we had these forms, you know, relapse signs, recovery signs. And I, I, yeah, and um, I, I have to tell you, it was very interesting. My number one relapse sign, because I was a 30-day wonder for like three years, you know, mm-hmm. every 30 days. Um, my number one relapse sign was being too busy doing good work. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I understand that one. Yeah, yeah. I would, yeah. I would plunge myself into my work. And, and 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 I'll never forget. I I lived in one of the most beautiful places on earth, Yosemite National Park. I, I lived there for three years, uh, wow. years ago, and uh, I was in management there. And I remember my supervisor uh, coming to me after three years and saying, "We're going to have to let you go." Um, he said, "When you are here, it is amazing the work that you do." But you're never here because, of course, the alcohol was, you know, I was missing work. I was always calling in sick. And as the alcoholism progressed, it got worse and worse and worse. And and uh, then years later, when I went through treatment, I remembered that day. And I thought, you know what? This is this is, for for money. Me getting too busy doing the right thing can take me out. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And our egos, because of the, the, the way we're wound as as recovered people, yeah. our egos are wound to it will attach itself to the work. My identity, when my identity gets confused and and, and my identity becomes the work that I do, there's I don't care what profession you're in, you're in trouble if you're in recovery. Yeah. I mean, you're 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 in trouble. And I've had I've had uh, my God I I think that's why why I'm on why God got me on the phones is because in doing this the work that I did because I you know there's not too many things I've done, I I haven't experienced in my 54 years mm-hmm. uh, you know I got identified at Dell as that was my work and uh, you know back in the day I was I had a 14 year career there and I'll never forget the day that uh, they let me resign because of my own uh, alcoholism and drug addiction uh, I resigned from that place and I, I was completely lost. I'm yeah, completely lost for 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 months uh, because I didn't know who I was. My whole identity was wrapped up in that. So I have a history of that, and uh, you know, thank God that uh, you know the last several years have been really nice for me because I do have that separation. Sure, sure, sure. And I I think uh, let me get your take on. It. I think particularly with men, you know, we we get a lot of our self esteem by the work that we do. Women get a lot of it from uh, from their husbands and and from the men in their life, but we seem to get it from our accomplishments. Uh, don't you think that's true? I do, I do. And yeah. you know, in, in, in my family dynamic, I mean, I, I, I was raised by a, a, a you know a Korean Marine. And wow. <laughs> so I mean, and, and and I don't remember my father once he got into the private sector and started working in it. I don't remember my my father who's now 82 years old, I don't remember him ever missing a day of work. Uh, he suited up and showed up every day. And so it, it became, so a lot of that's got to do with, 
Oh, I've got a lot of uh, a lot of stuff where you know I, I didn't feel like I met up all these years. So I mean, there's just so many combinations there. But uh, for whatever reason, I have uh, over over the over the course of my life, I've always made you know put work before everything else. And of course, and it's always the, it's that old saying that you know the thing that you put first will be the, uh, the the thing you put over your recovery will be the first thing that you lose. And uh, yeah, that's been that's that's what I've seen yeah. over the years. So. I don't know. I'm just so grateful that I've, you know, at this, you know, at this point in my recovery, I've, I've put a lot of things in perspective. I've been able to do so, or sure. I haven't been able, but you know, God with God's help, I have. Well, well, understanding what intervention is and 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 what it isn't. One of the the, the big things that I think families, maybe even somebody sitting there right now listening to this, uh, who suspects they're about to be intervened on. Um, the interventionist is not the enemy. True. Absolutely, they're yeah. an advocate. Yeah. And by the way, we're we're coming to get you. If you're listening, we're coming to get you. <laughs> yeah. Easy, you know, make it easy. Me, make it easy on us, and just go ahead and agree to come here. Yeah, if you think you were paranoid earlier, just look out. <laughs> yeah, get it over with and, and call us. But uh, you know, no, absolutely. You know, and that is so key. You see, if, if you do not do an intervention laced in love yeah. and get that connection at that and meet them where they're at and, 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 and you quickly let them know that you're not above them, that you're, you're, just, you're just an advocate. You're just there to support the family and them and, and moving towards wellness. And, uh, you know, when you go in with that attitude there, you'll, you're going to win every time. Uh, you know, you don't go in there with guns, bear, you know, bla uh, guns blazing. It's about going in there and getting a connection because without that connection, it's not going to happen anyway. Yeah, so you have to bet. get that connection. They must know that you've been to the places they've been in, going back to the doctor's opinion once again. You know, if the emotional feel, uh, feel seldom suffices, it takes a depth and weight message, which is, is really key. I, you know, going in and getting that connection, hey, buddy, I know what it's like to be alcoholic. I know what it's like to be cocaine addicted mm -hmm. without any cocaine in my system mm -hmm. and be completely uncomfortable, be completely bent over, want it. Once um, you get that connection, you know, you're, you're well on the way to getting the individual to move towards, towards wellness. All right. Uh, let me touch on this. This uh, we're almost out of time. Let me touch on this. This last piece here uh, in our, our first show intervention. What is it? Um, when you're intervene, you know when when this is all set up and and you've gone through the intervention, uh, and now it's time to. Uh, and we're going to touch on this more when it comes to uh, part four, transport and treatment. But I, I think it's going to bear repeating. Um, You've you've got to be, and I'm I'm assuming here. Correct me if I'm wrong. You've got to be really picky about where you're going to plug this person into, uh, as far as treatment goes, because you know as well as I do, there are treatment centers that do not treat the whole individual. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be faith based only, but there's no there there's no uh, uh, physical evaluation. There's no mental evaluation. Uh, 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 there's nothing going on about nutrition, uh, or it may be completely clinical without a spiritual end. How important is it that we treat the whole person? It's very important in, in the treat, you know, the treatment referral, which is part of the process of the intervention, is is picking the right place for the individual to go. Yeah. Usually, give them a couple of options of places to go, but you you know, you based on based on histories, based on a, a lot of different factors, you'll make that recommendation and let the family, you can, of course, talk to them, uh, talk to the treatment centers themselves. One of the things that that, that that I love about the place that I currently work at, you know, Benchmark Recovery and former more Houston recovery is that you know we, we don't take everybody we don't try to be everything to everybody sure. uh, you know we're a place where you know we we treat a pers we uh, we help people that, that are specific they've had all the therapy they they could teach treatment by the time they come to us they need a completely different approach mm -hmm. and so you know the, well, you know there's some people that, that, that don't belong here and if we get somebody here that is is inappropriate of course we'll refer them out 
But it's really important from the intervention level, whether you're doing it over the phone as an admissions person or whether you're in person uh, working with a family, it's, that is a real key key component. How well do they communicate with the with the family? How much are they involved in the family? I'm not talking about a formal family program where somebody comes down for a weekend and it's powerful and everybody goes back and digresses back yeah. to whatever they were doing. Who, who's working with you during the whole the whole whole treatment episode? Uh, you know, so it's very important where the person goes, and, and you know, there may be some psychological issues or some true co-occurring issues that need to be addressed appropriately. Maybe there's a plan set up. The plan has to be real solid where the person gets their eating disorder under under control, and then they go on it uh, go on into substance abuse treatment or vice versa. Uh, so there's a lot of different factors uh, that, that come to play when you're uh, when you're making a treatment referral. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, well, Tony, uh, we're, we're done with part one, uh, workshop number one, intervention. What is it? I I, I hope that uh, folks that didn't know have a little bit more of an understanding. Uh, before we sign off uh, on this first part, is, is there anything you'd like to to share with the listeners that maybe we haven't covered specifically about intervention? No, I think you, you you did a great job, Monty. I, I really appreciate. It. I'm honored to do this, and I want to tell you. I think the the real the real big thing I'd like to communicate with everybody is this: is and, and I'm not advocating, you know, uh, particular interventionist or anything like that. Right. I'm just, uh, you know, one, one of the things that's really important is is do not try to accomplish this on your own. Uh, you know, it's 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 way too much. You can cause a lot more damage than you can good. So get somebody somebody professional to come in and and execute this thing and it can be done properly and the success rates are over the top with interventionists. I mean it just is. I mean it, it's it's very effective. Uh, and uh, the last thing, lace everything in love. If that component is not in there, you can forget about it. Right. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. Uh, well, Tony, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. It, it, this means uh, so much. I look forward to uh, workshop two, three, and four as we continue this uh, little venture that we're doing here at Take12Radio.com, folks, uh, on your internet dial. Uh, Tony, stay on the line. Don't, don't, don't hang up when we close out because I want to talk to you just a, a bit off the air. Uh, uh, folks, uh, if you go to BenchmarkCenter.com, and that's where you'll find uh, uh, the website for where uh, Tony works, the Director of Admissions at Benchmark. And let me tell you, and, and you know I don't say this about about every treatment facility, but these these folks are are ones that are all about the solution. They really, really are. And uh, you, you know, whatever you can do, if if, if you can help support them uh, financially, if you can uh, use them as a, a reference point, uh, the phone number is there. Uh, you heard our, our little promotional piece. Uh, you can rewind this show and listen to that again. There's links here uh, on this page uh, as well on all of our main pages. There's there's also a text link on all of those to Benchmark Recovery. Tony Mesbarger uh, is our guest for this workshop, Director of Admissions at Benchmark Recovery Center in Austin, Texas. Hey, my friends. Listen, you can burn a copy of this CD by clicking on the download MP3 link, uh, right click, save as. Um, you can play it as a, a stereo uh, MP3 stream, or you can cl click on the YouTube and uh, watch my beautiful face as I'm talking to Tony uh, here at Take 12 Radio. Listen, until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man uh, along with Tony Messbarger, and we're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting.